Joe was born in the hamlet of Osable Forks on November 14, 1913. His father, Lewis, moved the family to Elizabethtown for a short time before settling in Upper Jay when Arta was 12 years old. It wasn't easy moving into this town at that time because there weren't many Catholics, and I was a Catholic, and there weren't any Italians, and I was Italian. So the kids used to kick hell out of me every once in a while. But they all became my best friends. And uh, my dad then built a tavern, a restaurant and bar, and uh, ran that for several years. And at that time, I used to have to help back that bar. And uh, I always had a talent for drawing. And I made up my mind I wasn't going to be a bartender. And I would have done anything to get the hell out of town and, uh, and uh, get into something other than tending by the rest of my life. It was that determination that led Monaco to the workshop of artist Rockwell Kent. At that time, Kent was living in Osable Forks, producing such famous paintings as this, entitled Godspeed. Kent had a profound impact on the young artist, especially when it came to his education. He said, uh, why don't you go to art school? And uh, I said, well, I didn't think my father would let me. He said, well, I'll talk to him. So he talked to dad about letting me go to art school. And Rock was uh, quite an important man in those days. And uh, so I was able to go to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. After attending Pratt Institute, he returned to Whopper J to work in his family's inn. It was there that he met Rockwell Kent's brother-in-law, motion picture director Lewis Milestone, who vacationed in Upper J. Milestone was a very influential man in his day. Working at MGM Motion Picture Studios in Hollywood, he had many powerful contacts. But the ambition and talent that he saw in the young Adirondack native caught his attention. So I went to... Uh, see him and he said gee you should get out to California and uh, I'll do all I can to help you. That was basically all the coaxing it took. A few weeks later the boy from Upper J took a giant step. I drove a car from Upper J New York to directly to Hollywood and uh, I, I immediately when I got there I went and I got a room and I parked my car and I walked directly up on the Hollywood and run. You know, it was just getting dark. But I went up there because I had to be at Hollywood and run. And I stood there in the corner and just all thinking, I'm here at the movie capital of the world. And here I'm from Upper J. You know, uh, nothing glamorous there. And here I am with all these people. Everybody working up and down the street was probably a a movie actor or an actor or a director or a cameraman or something. So I was just spellbound by the whole thing. Hollywood was no place for a young cub even in 1937. But Monica wanted to work in pictures, and he had a plan. Metro Goldwyn Mayer, the studio that boasted more stars than there were in the heavens, was about to meet a country boy with some very special friends. I remember the first day I went to, to MGM, uh, I had a, a note from uh, Donald Stewart and Milestone to see a Jack Shertock. So I went to his office. They let, I went through the main gate, MGM, and they told me where to go. And I went in there. And uh, I walked in this room. It was a long, long hall with nice big armchairs on each side, very ornate place. And I saw all these beautiful girls. God, I never saw so many gorgeous women in my life, and handsome men too, all sitting in these chairs, uh, showing off their legs and whatever they could. And, and I thought, all these people are here to... They have to be here to see Jack Shertox. He's never going to see me. And why should he come to let, uh, me, I'm this country bumpkin, in to see him? And I had a feeling that perhaps it weren't, but I had a feeling that everybody was staring directly at me. You know, I realize now that they weren't staring at me. They were staring at all those other handsome people around, wondering who's going to get the job. 
So finally, a, a lady came out and she said, uh, she asked for my slip, and I, she said, you were here to see Mr. Shertox? And I said, yes. He was a big producer at those, at MGM. And I said, yes. And she said, well, you wait here. And within about two minutes, a man came out the whole length of that hall, and he came directly to me, and he said, you are to Monaco? And I said, yes. And he shook my hand, and he says, well, come in my office, see me. And I thought, and all these other people are, are looking, who the hell is that guy? He must be somebody important. Among the stars and star makers of Hollywood, Monaco soon found that his position at MGM provided him many special friends and privileges. A typical day at the studio, of course, uh, was getting up at 5.30, 6 o'clock and getting with the studio for breakfast and uh, eating in the commissary. And uh, that's where all the stars and the directors and the producers eat, and the electricians and prop men. And uh, you might be having breakfast with George Washington or the King Arthur, or you might be having breakfast with uh, Louis Milestone or some other big director. And most often, you would be sitting opposite uh, some glamorous movie star. You didn't always recognize them in makeup. It was a real exciting day for someone of my age. And then after work at night, uh, I would hike back to the main lot and watch them shooting more pictures. Uh, during times when I had any time off and I saw a closed set, of course, an open set, anybody can walk onto the set and watch them shooting the picture. So, but that, you didn't see as glamorous as stars that way. You know, acting part, and you can go in any place. And I just go up to the, to the, uh, to the guard, the guard would be there, and I said, this is Roy, Roy set? And he'd say, yes, so I'd, I'd mark something down, and he'd say, uh, what time is it? He said, so, so I said, okay, I have to go and check it. Open the door for me, let me go in. I could watch him run all the way, making her pictures. Probably one of the most down-to-earth actors that I ever met. And he treated people wonderful. He was just truly a nice person. Arto met another legend who didn't have as nice a reputation. I found Charlie Chaplin to be quite a nice person. I know there's a lot of things about his personal life that's rather risque and things like that, but he treated me nice. The first time I met him was at Milestones at a dinner party. When I met him, I was, you know, sort of scared, really, to, to meet somebody that famous. And he mentioned the fact, well, Lewis and Kendall tell me that they live, they have a summer home up near where you live. And I said, well, I didn't know all about it. And he knew about Lake Placid in this area. And uh, he was, I'd say he was a decent man. Among others, Arto worked with Judy Garland, Betty Davis, and Mickey Rooney. But perhaps the most unique and memorable was his next door neighbor. One day while I was working at uh, the Gershwin's, uh, decorating, and you know, they decorated everything they could get their ha hands on. Uh, it was a, it was a vogue in those days. It was a campy thing to do. Oscar Levant and Ira were writing lyrics, and uh, they would be writing lyrics a lot of times while I was there decorating. And uh, one day, Oscar Levant just, they were stopped writing lyrics, and he went over the piano, and he played uh, several pieces. And so in the Gershwin's living room, he had a private concert. Music that embodied that carefree era. Pearl Harbor, the day of infamy. America was now at war, and by the spring of 1942, so was Ardo Monaco. The United States Army had little room for an artist in the early 40s, but once again, Private Monaco had a plan. What I should have done is enlisted, waited and been drafted and then gotten Frank Copper's outfit or somebody like that and stayed with the motion picture business. They wanted somebody to paint some latrine signs. So I volunteered for the job. <laughs> 